So welcome back to Animal Physiology, and today we're talking about heat and temperature. So what is temperature anyway? It is a measure of the average thermally induced molecular motion. So here, if we have our particle out in the universe, it is going to jump around. And that is because it has heat energy that's going to increase its random movements out in the world. And in order for reactions to occur, molecules, as you know, have to actually come together. They have to crash or collide. So that's why everything, even in biology, happens faster when things get hot. So the more motions you have, because it's hotter and jumping around, the more collisions you're likely to have and the more reactions. So even with enzymatic reactions, everything happens faster because you get more substrates coming into contact until, of course, it gets too hot and you kill the enzyme. Just wanted to remind you that kelvins are the unit are, are units of temperature and the kelvins range all the way from zero, which is when all molecular motions stop. So that is actually a theoretical limit, um, but they scale very linearly with linearly with Celsius and it's just a simple conversion. Temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of the molecular motions. So if you recall the kinetic energy formula is one half of mass times velocity squared. So this is related to temperature through the Boltzmann's constant and also with temperature in kelvins. What does this mean for our animals out in the world out there? Well, just like everything else out in the physical world, animals are also subject to these mechanisms of heat exchange. So what are they? Okay, let's start from the beginning. Metabolism, of course, is heat that the animal is generating by being alive. It's the fire inside or the little internal combustion engines inside of all the cells. As they metabolize, they generate heat. Many things love to bask. This little guy is a monitor lizard, a baby that we found in Papua New Guinea um, during one of our research expeditions. But anyway, he was basking out in the sun and what he's doing is absorbing radiative heat from the sun. There's also conduction, which happens. So he is actually absorbing heat from the hot rock that he's sitting on and it's going into his underside. And then if the wind is blowing, he's gonna also experience some convection. And convection is basically the animal giving up heat into the moving fluid as it's passing by. And so for an animal in air, the, the fluid medium is gonna be air, and in water, the fluid medium is gonna be water. Evaporation can also occur, and there's two kinds. Um, animals that breathe are going to experience respiratory evaporative water loss. I'm sorry, animals with lungs are going to experience respiratory evaporative water loss. Every time you take a breath, the, the moisture in your lungs is going to evaporate a little bit. There's also cutaneous evaporative water loss that happens through the skin. So for animals like this monitor lizard, like lizards, they tend to have very uh, thick keratinous skin that is pretty much impermeable to water. So they're not going to evaporate as much water through their skin as mammals and birds. So what are these mechanisms of heat transfer? Well, there's conduction, which is the transfer of heat through two solids that are in direct physical contact. And if one is hotter than the other, then the heat is going to go from hot to cold. It's governed by this equation. The rate of heat transfer through conduction is related to a thermal conductivity constant, which is a material property of the solid. It's going to be related to the surface area that's in contact. So the more that's touching, the higher it is. 
the temperature gradient between the two, or the difference in temperature, and then the distance between the two temperatures. You can sort of summarize most of this, because a lot of this doesn't change as much, um, to a conductive heat transfer coefficient times the temperature gradient, which is usually the thing that's changing for us. So the rate of conduction is going to be proportional to the amount of surface area in contact and the temperature gradient. A couple of things to notice is that as the heat transfer goes to equilibrium and the two bodies become similar in temperature, well, th that heat flow is going to go away because one's not hotter than the other. The other thing is that if the heat if the other object is much hotter, if the environment that you're touching is much hotter, well then the heat is going to go into you. Convection is the next mode of heat transfer that we're going to talk about and it is very similar to conduction except now it's the movement of heat through a fluid medium. Okay, And so the thing to keep in mind here is that heat exchange is going to be with the fluid boundary layer. So every object, like here's our little object out in the environment, is surrounded by a fluid boundary layer. So this is a boundary layer of either air or water, whatever fluid your animal is in. And a little hot body, like a mammal, is going to heat up that fluid boundary layer around it so that it's the same temperature as the body. Um, one thing to note is that in equilibrium, so when fluids get hot or there's a difference in temperature from the inner to the outer region of the fluid, they'll tend to swirl. This is just more convection. So convective heat transfer equilibrates pretty quickly into the fluid boundary layer. Okay, that's an aside. But anyway, so what happens when the fluid moves? So when you're in the wind or in a rough current, well, the moving fluid outside is going to push that boundary layer away, leaving you naked, okay? And so then you're gonna have to heat up the fluid boundary layer, a new one, all over again, okay? And so if this keeps getting pushed off and pushed off and pushed off and you keep heating and heating and heating the fluid boundary layer, well, you're gonna lose a lot of heat. And so this is why a cold wind can feel oh so cold and a cold rushing current can also feel incredibly frigid. So the um, rate of heat transfer through conduction is going to be related to the thickness of the fluid boundary layer and also the amount of surface area that's exposed, the temperature gradient, and also the rate of flow of the fluid. Okay, so therefore convection often can be much, much, much higher than conduction. The next mode of heat transfer is radiation. So this is where we, so something that's really kind of interesting is that all bodies emit spectral emissions. Isn't that cool? What that means is everything emits some sort of radiation. <laughs> everything. Um, Animals emit light, plants emit light, the sun emits light. It's related to the, the surface temperature, okay? So just to show you what I'm talking about, these are some images taken by um, a thermal camera. And it's, uh, it's sensitive to infrared light. And so if you just point it at the side of a house, you can see that here on this flat surface, it's really hot. Okay, and so different surfaces are going to have different temperatures and they're going to radiate different wavelengths of radiation. It's pretty cool. So this is what a city looks like on the bottom left here and on the right, a different view of a city, of, of the face of buildings. Well, also happens in animals. So here's some lizards on a hot rock and you can see that the rocks they're sitting on are very, very hot. Talk about nice, warm place to lie down. Um, they're really hot and they're heating up by sitting on them. So you can see that the animals are not any hotter 
than anything in the environment, which is pretty interesting because um, they're ectotherms, right? Uh, on the bottom here are two endotherms, a bird and a mammal, a mule. So look at that. They are hotter than their environments. And what's interesting is that the hottest part on these little guys is, of course, their brains. And the bird, um, also the thoracic cavity, which is like the heart. Um, if you look at the lizards, uh, not so much in the hot brain area. Haha. <laughs> Another cool image is this bat at night, which is just so cool, I think. You see that the, the environment is way colder, but the bat is hot, and you can see that the muscles, the flight muscles involving the limbs are, are hot. Really cool. Okay, so everything out there emits spectra, but of course, um, the sun emits way more than any animal possibly can. It's just way hotter. So what we're going to be trying to estimate is the net, the net radiative heat transfer. Okay, And so it's going to be mainly from the sun, and it's going to be proportional to the surface area that's exposed and the amount of, of course, and how much time is, this, is the sun going to be out at the hottest time of the day. Um, of course, you're not going to get any at night. Lastly, we're going to talk about evaporation, which is specifically heat that is released or transferred when water evaporates. So every living thing is composed of water. And so uh, everything, mostly everything, has water at, on its surface. and um, as the water vapor evaporates from the body, you can shed a lot of heat. It's, uh, so this is the equation for the rate of heat transfer due to evaporation, and it's proportional to the surface area. Um, it's proportional to the water vapor density gradient, and it's going to be uh, inversely proportional to the resistance to water loss. So the more resistant your skin, the lower your rate of evaporative water loss. So why this is such an important mechanism is because the latent heat of evaporation is huge. In other words, evaporating water releases a lot of heat, a lot, about 2400 joules per gram at 40 degrees Celsius. Now that's a little hotter than most living things, but it's, it's close, it's around, it's huge. Um, alternatively, it only takes about 480 joules per gram to heat water from zero freezing to boiling <laughs> okay so it's only 480 but it's 2400 from um not evaporated from from uh liquid to gaseous phase it's pretty pretty amazing and so this is essentially a property of water okay um so what's interesting about this mode of heat transfer is it is the one that does not depend on temperature directly. So when we apply it to animals, we always assume that the surface of the skin is 100% saturated with water vapor. So that means right at your skin surface, that relative humidity right next to the skin is 100%. <laughs> um, so this is why when there's Kona weather and the humidity is so oh so high in Hawaii, you feel so gross because the the environmental relative humidity is is the same as your body, and so there's no gradient and no heat that's being transferred because there's no evaporation. Um, so water vapor density is a measure of the amount of water particles in in the air and um, it's going to be related to relative humidity and temperature. Okay, so that's the only way that temperature comes into play, but it's not very sensitive to temperature. It's really sensitive to water vapor density. So sometimes, so, so a lot of people say when their animal's in trouble, oh, it's just going to sweat. Okay, so that might seem like a great idea, but actually only a few animals sweat profusely. And of course, humans are one of them, so we all sweat, so we think everything sweats. But most mammals don't really sweat like we do. The most famous one is our horses. Horses can sweat 
whoo, they can really sweat. Very aerobic animals. But most animals only have um, sweat glands on the bottom, uh, most mammals only have sweat glands on the bottoms of their feet, on their feet pads, if they have them. Okay, and this is because there's actually two kinds of sweat glands. So the ones on those um, pads of the feet are the sweat glands that sweat uh, this kind of sticky, waxy uh, lipid so so solution. And it, um, it's the kind of sweat that we also sweat in our armpits, in our you know, pu pubic areas and other places where skin rubs. And it keeps the skin pliable and flexible and moist. Um, and it also tends to be kind of stinky. So horses have that too, and that's why when they work up a huge sweat, they, they often tend to get frothy. You see this, like this white sweat forming on them, which is really kind of interesting. But um, only humans and horses have the other kind of sweat glands that are all over the body and produce a very liquid sweat. But of course, there's more than one way to get wet, isn't there? So elephants are pretty famous at spraying water all over themselves, and why do they do that? Well, so that then they can evaporate and shed a lot of heat. Um, lots of animals bathe, lots of animals find ways to get wet, and when animals are super desperate, they can even pee on themselves, okay? So when you're desperate and you're like about to heat, reach critical temperature, if you pee all over yourself, well, the water evaporation will cause your temperature to go down. Okay, so there's lots of things that animals can do. Um, so what we talked about is how do we calculate the total heat balance? Okay, so the heat balance equation is written like this, and we're going to be looking at whether after you account for metabolism, conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation, well, what's that? overall net value, is there a positive, which means that the temperature of the animal is going up, or is it negative, which means the temperature of the animal is going down, or is it pretty much close to zero? So this lecture was intended to familiarize you with the mechanisms for heat exchange, which is basically all thermodynamics. We're going to be using in our um, animal design projects, scaling equations to estimate sort of an average value for these different rates of heat, heat of metabolism, heat of conduction, convection, evaporation, etc., for our various animal taxa. These basic uh, baseline models are gonna be informed by the values that you are researching and collecting now for the environmental temperature at the time that it lived, um, what was its probable body temperature? What was its mass? What was the relative humidity during the time that it lived and where it lived? And all of these kinds of really interesting and important environmental variables. You're gonna then have the option to refine your model if you want based on other biological information. So you have a basic model and then you can actually even try to estimate what is the insulative value of fur or fat, you know, whatever. Um, you can have some fun with this. So there's all kinds of information out there. It, this is a figure from your book and it shows the insulation value or alternatively the resistance value of various uh, kinds of either fur or blubber in animals related to the thickness of those materials. So there's all kinds of data for different taxa. And something that's really interesting is that the top portion of the graph, the, the upper quadrants, is the white part is in air, okay? And then the bottom part on the right that's orange is in water. And so what's really interesting is that for these terrestrial taxa, most of them, if you can manage to dampen the fur to get it all wet, the insulation value goes way down. And it's really not that different than let's say for water or tissues, okay? The other, um, and so that's for, you know, all kinds of terrestrial taxa that they've compared. But when you look at seals, which are of course marine and um, can even live in very cold climates, their insulative value is lower in air, but the really cool thing is when it's thoroughly wet, 
it doesn't change that much. So I think that's pretty cool. If you would like to use this information to modify your models, feel free to come see us. Uh, it's a little bit complicated because uh, these things have different units than perhaps your data will be in, and it requires some conversion, but we can definitely do it. Okay, see you in class. Bye-bye.